earliest uh, the earliest in the morning I've ever done a blogging heads. Well, it's it's yeah, it's nine a.m. It's not like I'm some slave driver here, but uh, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, you're not. <laughs> we know who the slave driver is, and he should uh, he should own up to it. But it's it's neither of us. <laughs> it's outside forces. Right, right, exactly. A person who's been kiting, kiting together a, a for-profit media operation and free talent, you know, such as it is, uh, for X number of quite a quite a number of years now. Right, right, and 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 we're getting up early to help him produce that profit. <laughs> <laughs> um, this guy's is getting up early. Uh, well, let's say who we are. I'm, a, I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm a senior fellow at the uh, Franklin and Eleanor, at the Roosevelt Institute, we now call it. It used to be called the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute, but now we just we tightened up the name. Got it. And, I, and I'm Jim Pinkerton. I'm a, a contributor to the Fox News Channel. Uh, I'm a, con a contributing editor to the American Conservative Magazine, and a, uh, I run a blog called Serious Medicine Strategy, uh, dot org. And, and Mark and I both used to work at the New America Foundation. We did. We, we, former, we became friends. Former colleagues. Former colleagues and still friends. So, yeah. so just for fun, what is, I mean, the, the, the very 21st century nomenclature, uh, you know, boiling it down to just a, a, a one word or a logo or something, the way companies do, companies and entities do these days, uh, <laughs> what is the Roosevelt Institute? Well, the Roosevelt Institute, I'm not boiling, I can't boil it down that, that uh, tightly. The Roosevelt Institute is, it's, basically a think tank uh, based in New York uh, with with kind of three parts to it. One that's been around a long time is as the nonprofit partner to the Roosevelt Library, the FDR Library in Hyde Park, New York. You know, all the presidential libraries have nonprofit partners is one of the one of the <coughs> a couple years ago they did two things. They merged with an organization that had set that had created by itself that was calling itself the Roosevelt Institution, which was a group of college students who wanted to work on interesting policy ideas and so forth. That's now the Roosevelt Campus Network, and it's a completely awesome uh, project on you know 300 campuses, a lot of uh, a lot of different kinds of, of schools, um, large, small, public, private. Really, uh, incredibly exciting uh, project, and they've done great stuff. They did it fantastic. Uh, federal budget project uh, earlier in the year. And then there's a, a think tank that's done a lot of work on financial reform and, and issues like that that has a, has a group of fellows, some based in New York. I'm, I'm the only one who happens to be based in Washington and uh, a few around the country. And we've been you know, blogging and putting out papers and doing the, the, uh, a lot of conferences uh, recently. We just did one on kind of the future of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and uh, federal homeownership policy. <laughs> Fannie, Fannie Mae created in 1938, as I recall, uh, um, a, a New Deal institution that sense. kind of went bad, I would say. I guess. <laughs> it didn't go good. Uh, so the, the degree of blame to assign to, the, to Fannie Mae for the housing crisis and, uh, and, and the, uh, what form it's, it should take in the future are definitely issues of controversy. Right, and, and yeah. it, it is and interesting. And we stirred up I mean, some <clears throat> Fannie, Fannie Mae spent <clears throat> the first, you know, 30 or 40 years of its existence just sort of as a neutral, you know, housing housing broker and, you know, help, you know, build suburbia and so on. And then somewhere in the 80s or 90s, they, you know, various people uh, who were much uh, uh, discussed in books like uh, Gretchen Morganson's and, uh, uh, book Re Reckless Endangerment figured out, wow, we could really get rich doing this. And so it completely transformed itself, sort of a parable of the New Deal becoming sort of neoliberal Clintonism. Um, uh, um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's definitely the basic story told in that book. I mean, another way to look at it is that is that as the private sector, as this became something that you actually, you know, there was a lot of this that the private sector could do with the with its own securitization of mortgages. Uh, a lot of what Fannie Mae was up to was how do we keep our share of this market? And that and that led to a lot of uh, a lot of their misbehavior, but um, a, a lot of that was what we discussed in that conference. And, and gotcha. Greg gotcha. Morganson's co-author mm -hmm. Jeremy Rosner was one of the. Uh, oh, they were they were there. Uh, yeah, his name is uh, Josh Rosner. Okay, uh, got he it. Was yeah, there. Yeah. She wasn't. Yeah, got it. So. Got it. Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, um, anyway, so that's, all right. That's well, there, 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 there you have it. Um, so. We, we can't have a conversation without talking about the Republican presidential. Right, we, we can. And we, have to, we have to start with the new flavor du jour. Uh, well, the, 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 three days ago it was Herman Cain. Now, it's, now today, this is Thursday, the 29th. 
it's Chris Christie. There's three and, and Herman Cain has the advantage of he is actually Herman Cain actually is running for president. <laughs> right. But at the moment, it seems like he's it's, he's treated as less likely to actually be president than Chris Christie. Right, right. So we've had it, you know, everybody gets their gets their gets their turn in the barrel. Uh, um, I'm getting mine in December. <laughs> Watch it. Mark, <laughs> mark your calendar. Well, listen. <laughs> uh, um, you, you get yours before me, for sure. Uh, no, I exactly. <laughs> You're highly more qualified. <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 I saw something interesting last night, and that is in NBC. I mean, <clears throat> first of all, the fact that the Washington Post has three, three articles on Christie today, three. Right. Uh, uh, is And none of them are hostile. Mm-hmm. Uh, is, it, is it tells me that sort of a point that I've sort of grudgingly come to realize, and that is that that you know a, a, a good chunk of the media, you know, is sort of always ready to fall in love with a you know a Nelson Rockefeller, a Chuck Percy, a, a Tom Kane, uh, uh, these kinds of figures in the Republican Party, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and Chris Christie is now sort of the latest of those. Uh, you know, he's not your he's not in but in any stretch your classic. Sort of you know blue blood Republican at all, um, right? But but he but he fits a lot of the kind of needs, and so what I mean, I I think that NBC News on Wednesday night, Brian Williams, you know, this is the big, you know, the faded but still big show, uh, used the clip from of Chris Christie at the Reagan Library and this woman saying, you know, Governor, we need you, and you know, and for for them to include the audio because you couldn't see the woman was off camera in the audience, for them to include the audience, <clears throat> tells me that basically that's kind of what NBC thinks too. I mean, I, I'm sort of, <laughs> I'm seriously, I don't, I don't think that's a, right. an editorial choice. I've been around television for a long time, and, you know, every, every bit of sip of audio, Christie Christy makes an hour speech and they use 20 seconds of it, that, 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 that it's very telling which 20 seconds they use. So I kind of think that um, well, Obama's in more trouble than if, assuming somebody like Christie were to get in the race. Well, I mean, maybe, but the only reason for NBC to run that story is as is, is to the extent that it becomes a horse race story, and that's the only interesting thing happening in the horse race right now. So it's not like NBC is going to run a story that says, you know, governor gives policy speech at the Reagan Library. Uh, well, right, but you know what I mean. I mean, if if Deval Patrick gave a speech, you, they wouldn't cover it. Right, but why? Why are, <clears throat> why are they covering I mean, it for them to? I, I just detect a significant groundswell yeah. of of feeling that, including among you know liberal intelligentsia types, or you know, or right, right. center center left, if you call it, more centrist right. and left, I and mean, that's for sure, more centrist than left. Uh, right. That wow, I mean, and again, there, there, we as we speak, there's no particular evidence he's going to run. Christy, that is, there's no particular evidence that he uh, would do well if he did. In right. terms of just, it's, it's, this is a hard thing to do. Ask Rick Barry. Uh, um, right. But I was I was just struck by the degree of enthusiasm among uh, people who I'm sure all voted for Obama in 08 for for a, right, for, right. For, an, for, an, not, for an alternative not a great alternative not, I mean I don't mean not a profoundly different alternative like say Rick Perry but sort right. of a course correction. Right. Well, Rick Perry. I mean, I think you know Mike Allen had a little you know w- one liner yesterday in his playbook email. Um, that said something very similar, like, you know, there's a huge amount of discontent out there in the kind of mainstream businessy community, and that's why there's so much money going after Chris Christie to run. Um, but that raises a lot of questions, such as, you know, well, what's wrong with Rick Perry and Mitt Romney? And obviously what's wrong with Rick Perry for that group is, a, is you know, he's, he's culturally different. That's a sense that he's a bit of a loose cannon and... and, and um, and, and likely to self-destruct, um, and then I guess a sense that Romney just doesn't click with people or um, uh, comes across as phony, which he does, uh, it leads you to look for something. I, I, I think I don't think it's right. To, I don't think Christie indulges the um, you know the, the Nelson Rockefeller fantasy uh, so much as he indulges the kind of we need you know the people who say we need straight talk. You know the, the kind. You know Mitch Daniels had a little of that. Um, Perot had a little of that. There's that. There's that. Um, that sense of I'm gonna. You know, I'm just gonna tell. I don't care if I if I piss people off. I'm gonna tell. Uh, them Donald, Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump had a little of that, even though he had no idea. You know, he was just talking nonsense most of the time. Um, so Christie has a little of that that people feel like that's what they're looking for 
in, in American politics. Of course, it's easy to mistake, you know, just being obnoxious for straight talk. <laughs> and, I, and I think that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that I, that I, I, I think, I, I think Christie falls on just the obnoxious side of the line. Um, and of course, one person's straight talk is another person's, uh, and McCain, of course, was the classic of that. McCain was not in, indulged by the press because he was, you know, a liberal Republican, so a moderate Republican as much as because he, everything he did. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think they, they loved him. I mean, I mean, again, I mean, you're, you're making a good point, and that is there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a psycho, and I don't mean psycho, like, psych, psych, you know, there's a psychological dimension to Christie of he's candid, he's blunt, he, he tells right. it like it is. I, I, you're completely right. On the other hand, he also is telling it like it is on fiscal issues. Right, and, that's right. And that's Brian right. Williams pays, you know, hundred thousand a year in property taxes in New Canaan, Connecticut, and doesn't like it, uh, and because and has figured out that every school teacher is, you know, you know, you know, you know, the, the, the new, these horror stories about, or depending on how you look at it, these stories about, you know, what public employees are getting paid. You know, these people are making eight hundred thousand a year, including overtime and stuff. This is this is grinding on, uh, you know, upper middle class suburbanites who, you know, obviously dominate the media. Uh, um, a, a great deal, and for, if Christie were saying the same thing about abortion or stem cell or something like that, they would hate him. Right, right, right. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, he separates those those things out um, in a, in a very nice in a very nice. I mean, he checks all the boxes for the social conservatives, but there's no you know pe people do have and, and McCain was similar. There's no sense that he actually cares about those issues at all. Right. Right, right. And McCain was willing to carry water for the left, left on tobacco yeah. and you know, opposing Bush right. tax cuts and so on. So they liked him. Right. I mean, he had an ideological as well as a psychological. Right. Well, McCain was a little more complicated. I mean, Christie's just a strict. Christie is actually a straight line conservative, <coughs> um, but you know what he cares about and what he doesn't care about. Right. 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 Um, but uh, I, I don't. I don't. I mean, he he is only two years into his term as governor. You know, he's basically at the same point Sarah Palin was. Um, he's had some success in that state, not, you know, uh, about as much as you can before the tide turns on you. And, and you know, frankly, I mean, a lot of it has depended on working, working with the most corrupt elements of the Democratic machine in New Jersey. Um, how, how so? Which, well, I mean, this is something that uh, Steve Kornacki at, at Salon, who, who actually knows New Jersey politics far better than most people I know, and certainly far better than I do. You know, he, he wrote a lot about how, uh, you know, Corzine as governor had kind of, you know, there are two power structures. There's the Essex County Democratic machine, and then there's the Camden County uh, Democratic machine, and the, and the county party chairs are incredibly powerful, not, you know, ba basically across their whole region. Um, so there's a guy in South Jersey named George Norcross Jr., and in uh, North Jer Jersey, it's mostly it's old, uh, a guy named Steve Adubato and, and his son. And, um, and they basically, you know, cut a deal with Christie to sit out, the, you know, to not mobilize Democratic, Democratic voters on behalf of Corzine and, uh, and, and, and sit out the election. And then Christie, for example, Christie uh, got, uh, basically got rid of the state's uh, public broadcasting system, NJN, and worked out a deal in which it sort of more or less wound up in the hands of Steve Adubato Jr. in in Essex County. I mean, it's a it's a corrupt state, and um, and 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 Christie got some stuff done by by operating within the within the democratic uh, system of democratic corruption, making him somewhat different from somebody like like Christine Todd Whitman or or Governor Kane, who really got themselves elected. In a totally in, in a different era. I mean, really, quite a long time ago now, and um, by by mobilizing a suburban constituency that's now largely moved back to the Democratic Party. Um, so, so Christie's a, Christie's pol political history is a kind of interesting and complicated one. I also think, yeah, I I, I was always it bothered me that um, in that race, not much was made of Christie's record as a prosecutor, which consisted of a number of he did, uh, seven. Uh, Cases of deferred prosecution, where he would go out and go to a company and say, you know, we're gonna, we were going to prosecute you for this fraud or whatever, but we won't in exchange for your doing the following things, which in every case involved hiring a friend or law partner of Christie's 
In one case, it was John Ashcroft. In another case, it was another former U.S. attorney. Uh, in another case, it was somebody who'd been a fundraiser for him uh, to, to monitor your activities. These are deferred prosecution agreements. They're not reviewed by courts. And uh, the, the biggest one was that he went after Bristol Myers Squibb and said, we won't prosecute you if you do a number of things, including endowing a chair at Seton Hall University, which happens to be Chris Christie's alma mater. Um, so I think that's just an extraordinarily corrupt activity. And I think conservatives should think that you know, this, is the, this is the epitome of government uh, getting it. You know, a government figure comes and says, you know, uh, we, we, could, we could make your life very difficult. Why don't you, uh, why don't you pay up instead? Um, I, I think conservatives should actually be kind of outraged by that. <clears throat> Chris, welcome to the NFL. <laughs> Jacques. <laughs> uh, yeah, th those right. Th th this I have, I've been look. I've been in and around you know five or six presidential campaigns, and I can tell you the, the ones that think through what they're doing in advance and have answers for all these questions right. and so on uh, right. do better than the ones who don't. Right. And well, that's what we're seeing with Perry. I mean, we're clearly right. seeing that with Perry. That guy had not been. He, he hasn't spent the last seven years thinking about running for president. Right. He spent 10 years saying, look, I'm <clears throat> him saying, too, I'm too blunt, I'm too raw right. uh, to ever be president. And then, then he spent two months saying, well, okay, if you think I can do it, you know, okay, fine. And right. now yeah, exactly. <laughs> the previous wisdom has kind of asserted itself. Um, but, I, you know, I also, back to Romney, I mean, I, um, I, I did notice, uh, um, uh, uh, back to my point about reporters, uh, Dana Milbank at the Washington Post. Saying this maybe two weeks two weeks ago now, uh, when, when when Perry was sort of at his peak, uh, you know, again he might still yet be the nomination, be the nominee, be president. Who knows? It was peak as of this little cycle we're in right now. Uh, um, uh, Dana Milbank saying to his readers that you know Perry could win, and the only person who can stop Perry is not Obama; it's Romney. And right. so the headline of the piece was Democrats for Romney. It kind of kind of made an impression on me in terms of <clears throat> you know wow. I mean uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the reporters are more well. Okay, but Mark, you're, 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 I think you were the first one back in '07 who was said, saying with a straight face, you know, that look, you know, Obama could win this thing, and, I, and, and not just the nomination. You know, the, 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 and this, this is all through '07. You know, Hillary Clinton was ahead and stuff. Yeah, People yeah. said, well, she'll win, she'll win. And then uh, Obama. I wasn't. I certainly well, obviously wasn't the first one. But I no, you weren't. But you're the first one to say it regularly to me, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and and yeah. so. Um, how, how would you summarize? We haven't we haven't done a blogging heads in a year or two. So how would you right. summarize things as they have transpired? Um, you mean you mean summarize the Obama Obama Obama, 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 yeah. Obama yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's so. I feel like the the trajectory of Obama. And I remember writing about this during even during the 2008 campaign. You know, part of it was a matter of you you know you never could sustain. You can't sustain that kind of. It did emerge as a, as a kind of a cult of personality, or you, you know, there was a sense of, of um, it, it promised far more than the American political process can ever deliver. Um, so part of it was a matter of just kind of ratcheting it down to become a more to become a more kind of ordinary on the ground politician. Because I mean, the part of the problem that he had with voters, that he, particularly white middle class voters, was that he or working class voters was that he. You know, if that if that thing if if that big promise didn't click, he did, he wasn't offering the bread and butter that a Hillary Clinton does. You know, just a kind of much more ordinary democratic politics. Um, so he had to kind of ratchet it down. And I think in the process of ratcheting, it, he's he's kind of caught in a trap now where he no longer has any of the kind of magic of that very you know the, the really what lasted in maybe a couple of weeks into 2009 at best. Um, he no longer has any of that, but he doesn't quite have the tools. It, so, he's a, so he's reduced to being a kind of ordinary president um, without a lot of the tools for, uh, uh, for doing that. And I, I think what happened in the last couple of weeks, I've kind of argued it two different ways. On the one hand, uh, I think it's a, uh, the turn towards the language of the uh, speech to Congress uh, in particular, and then his um, his uh, budget presentation last week. Uh, it, 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 on the one hand, it's a bit of a turn to the it's a turn to a slightly angrier language. To me, it's a it's a marker that okay, we're now done with actually trying to get anything done in in this uh, in this administration, and now we're about drawing some of the lines for the for the reelection. Um, at the same time, I also think that it is you know 
I, 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 I kind of, I wrote about this in the Republic the other day, I kind of chafe at this being called, uh, you know, populism, that he's now turned to populism, obviously, and the, the other, the other term is class warfare, which, which I, I also reject, but, but to really call it populism, I mean, this is still basically somebody who's, uh, you know, looking for some kind of um, cross-partisan or cross-ideological connection, I mean, the, you know, the, the tax, the proposal to tax, to increase the tax on millionaires is not, you know, it's presented with Warren Buffett as its validator. It's not exactly, a, you know, coming, <laughs> coming up from the, from, from the, from the radical roots. But I don't, I, I mean, I don't know where we are now, and, and it's interesting to think about, um, I, I don't know that anything would be different if, uh, if Hillary Clinton had been the nominee and, and, and won the presidency. Um, uh, you know, I think some things would have, Obviously, things would be different uh, because the expectations for Obama, and maybe that's part of the answer to the expectations for Obama were at a very high level. And of course, Clinton had a little more basic experience. Um, but I don't really, you know, one analysis would be Hillary Clinton understood that all the Republicans would get in her way, <laughs> and 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 I think that's probably true. She probably did understand that a little better. But I don't know that. I don't know that one would behave in a very different way anyway, because there are only so many opportunities to just do things on a, on a partisan basis. Um, right, and, and, yeah. and I mean, the, the country, these Gallup polls have shown unbelievable steadiness on this basic ideological split of the country, you know, uh, conservatives 40, uh, right. moderate 30, liberal 20. Uh, so you're right. dealing with you're dealing with a weak weak hand if you're trying to govern from the left. I must say that. Well, I, I mean, I'm not. You know, I I, I actually really. Uh, Bill Galston wrote a piece the other day that said if you don't put a lot of faith in ideological self identification, don't keep reading this article. So I didn't keep reading the article <laughs> because I because I do think I think those things shift a, and 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 people people like to identify themselves as moderate and yet they nonetheless support a you know a lot of basically liberal ideas. You just have you can't you can't package it that way. Um, and, and, and part of Obama's problem is that it got kind of packaged for it. People, you know, the classic one being the health care plan, which was, which was the Republican health care plan of the 1990s, uh, is seen as a far left plan because it's one that was supported only by Democrats and didn't have Republican support. So that becomes a kind of heuristic for it must be a far left plan. Well, I mean, I think I think it's, I think another way to, another way to take those exact same data points is the country has moved to the right, you know, uh, uh, um, and and again, I, it, it's as Obama proved, you can win an election, uh, right. and, and by a pretty substantial margin, um, right. and still have this sort of sinking feeling if you're a liberal that the country is, you know, I mean, again, is more conservative than not, and, and right. now Hillary, Bill Clinton, and perhaps. In his presidency, and perhaps Hillary Clinton, if she if she'd had one, uh, uh, and you know who knows, but I mean that's that's the world's biggest you know goose chase to talk about her presidential right. prospects. So we're not going to do it. Uh, um, <laughs> would would have had a better capacity to anchor, you know, whatever it is they're doing in more uh, conservative sounding language. However, however, mm -hmm. I am struck by you know, and I'm sure you, you are too, by the by the Ron Susskind book, Confidence Men, mm -hmm. uh, um, which Makes a pretty good argument. Makes two arguments, as far as I can tell. One is that basically this was sort of the Clinton administration over again, right. and two, the Clinton administration, in in, in the Obama disguise, uh, continued the basic Clinton policies, which you know uh, uh, Joel Kotkin, another colleague of ours, a uh, uh, former colleague with the New America Foundation, uh, who now has a blog called NewGeography.com, uh, calls gentry liberalism, which I think is a very uh, uh, apt phrase for describing this sort of synthesis of, you know, Wall Street and 125th Street, uh, um, you know, where, you know, the, the Democratic base of you know, African Americans stays loyal, and the country is kind of run through, you know, Bob Rubin and his, uh, you know, acolytes, and you know that that's a that's been that, that those that. That's, Philosophy has won three presidential elections in the last twenty years. They 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 know something about you know something is a little less clear. They know how to you know prevent uh, uh, bubbles and they know how to prevent the middle class from er eroding all the way from here to China. Right, right, right. No, it's a full, it's a it's an approach to economics that actually you know had some successes in the nineteen nineties and um, you know unfortunately I mean I think the tragedy is coming in at that moment of crisis. I mean I, I often ask people. 
who who did you think could have been Treasury Secretary uh, at that moment? You know, there's no on-the-job training for Treasury Secretary in January 2009. Um, so what's your list of people who could have been Treasury Secretary, which are basically, it's Tim Geithner, it's Paul Volcker, somebody mentioned Brooks Lee Bourne to me the other day, um, who I think would have been a possibility. There, there may be a couple other people. It's not, you know, it's not Paul Krugman, for example, right. as, as Treasury Secretary. So there's a limited, the, you know, there, the, you need people with some experience, therefore you need people with the experience of that 90s um, uh, uh, Era and I think you you saw their limits. Now the Susskind book is kind of complicated by the fact that it makes a villain. It, you know, it, it makes that story easy to tell by making Larry Summers kind of the the villain. But at the same time, it seems that Larry Summers was on the right side of most of the policy arguments that he lost, which kind of complicates it a little bit. I mean, Summers seems like somebody who, for all his personal Disagreeability and everything else actually did learn some lessons. Right. I, I thought. I thought. I think again. I think you could divide it up again. Personality. It looks like we're dealing with you know Chuck Percy versus Chris Christie. Summers is the villain for his own personality, and I thought. Guy you mentioned Chuck. Villain. You mentioned Chuck Percy twice in the in this uh, like that. Somebody who just passed away last week and probably. Yeah, exactly. that's why it's kind of on my mind. And I and I yeah. grew up in in Chicago, so he was yeah. he was yeah. the senator there or one of them when I when I was growing up. And right. he, again, he sort of epitomized kind of. You know, he was actually. You know, a self-made guy. He was not, you know, some blue blood. He was not to the manner born at all. Um, you know, but as a hardworking guy. But in any case, came to capture, uh, at least for a moment in the '60s, that kind of gee, we could have some, you know, Nelson Rockefeller-ish, handsome guy being president, and then you know, he sort of faded away and ultimately lost for re-election in 1984. Uh, to um, Paul Simon. To Paul Simon, right? Uh, right. Uh, but in, in any case, where were we? Uh, Chris uh, Summers has the person loses the personality contest, but to me. Geithner is the villain in terms of the policy, and and the example, the best example being, you know, again, you know, and Obama loses too because he can't control Geithner. Right. If you're going to give Citigroup 100 billion dollars or whatever we gave them, we all we certainly should have restructured the company. We should have fired everybody there. We should have brought in you know bureaucrats and stuff to run the place for 100 thousand a year, not leaving in place people making 20 million a year uh, uh, to prove to the future Wall Street that the moral hazard is still in place. Right, right. Although, you know, both the politics and the, I mean, you, you look at all the, you, you look at all the negative politics that, that existed as a result of the, um, you know, the, the, the Wall Street bailout plus the, uh, the auto bailout, which has turned out to be, to be quite successful. It, you know, you add nationalization of that type to the to the equation politically, and it's a big disaster. And I think one of the one of the problems of two thousand nine was, you know, if you had a huge political setback, if you really could, and this this applies to the stimulus as well, if you really got knocked back on your heels, then you were then you were in a, a much much tougher position uh, than than you would have been just by just by finding a way to to, to muddle through. Well, I don't. I say I'm not sure. I agree. I think. Look, I think free marketeers, you know, uh, purists uh, would think. Look, Citigroup, uh, you know, gambled and you know lost, and so now they're getting punished for it. I, I, I'm not. You know, obviously the goal would be to sell it off to some new set of owners at, at right. you know whatever price you pay. I, I think there would have been more well, support. Break it up and break it up and sell it off. Yeah. Turning turning it into the you know uh, 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 well genu genuine punishment for people getting the bailouts. You know, uh, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we'll, 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 yeah. we'll, we'll never know. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, it is an it is an interesting book made complicated by some kind of confusing reporting, I think. Uh, but but it does reveal. I mean, uh, I, I think it does reveal a little bit of inexperience and a little bit of um, you know a culture of the White House. And one of the things that I always really liked about Obama was that he seemed to. Um, he seemed to take a broad counsel, you know. He didn't. He didn't seem to have that that very closed circle of people that he trusted, and um, uh, he, you know, somehow I, I feel like that's shifted a little bit in the White House, and partly that's that you, you know that inability to get out of, uh, of, of of the bubble that that he had, and then a little more of the. I mean, I'm surprised. The other thing that surprised me in that book. Is the idea of kind of the Chicago crowd? I mean, I thought one of the interesting things about Obama, you know, unlike, you know, to me, I always compare Obama's circumstances with 
the previous two Democratic presidents, right, Carter and Clinton. And both Carter and Clinton come in, they have no Washington experience, and they bring with them a hometown crowd that has even less Washington experience, you know. So it's like Matt McClarty as chief of staff in the Clinton White House, or Hamilton Jordan in the in the Carter White House, that sort of sort of scene. And it always goes horribly awry, at least for a while. And I thought Obama had escaped some of that, and I think one of the things that the Susskind book re reveals is that there's a little more of a closed in Chicago circle than you would than you would have expected, um, given given that he's not you know he's not a you know he's he's the most sort of cosmopolitan right. guy. I mean, he, 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 he seems comfortable on the coast. That that right. certainly right. expands the talent pool uh, uh, enormously. Right, he's not a product of Chicago the way Bill Clinton was a product of Arkansas. Right, or or right, or 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 Carter, Georgia. So anyway, right, right. Um, yeah. Um, changing subjects, if you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a bit, but uh, 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 Fareed Zakaria uh, has an has an op-ed in the Washington Post, <clears throat> Washington Post this morning, saying that if you want to do infrastructure right, uh, as in actually build things, as opposed to simply spend money. And this is a little bit of a, a dig at Obama, but nonetheless, it's, you know, it's, it's his article in the Washington Post. Uh, you'd have to suspend uh, wage laws, and you'd have to suspend environmental impact statements just to get things done. You know, it says, you know, well, you know there, there's a you know, hundred thousand people unemployed in Detroit. Uh, those are the ones you want to put to work. You know, uh, right. you know building a park in Detroit or a highway or whatever it is in, in, in Detroit. And <clears throat> and I think this is an interesting point on the, you know, I mean, and this is where. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, I think, had it, had it right. You know, when people are unemployed, put them to work, uh, uh, do things. And it was interesting to see somebody actually kind of make this argument, a, a purely Keynesian argument, but right. with the, the going back to the way Roosevelt would have done and Harry Hopkins would have done in the 30s, as opposed to the way it was done, which is to say not done, uh, in, right. the, in the O's and teens. Right, right. Um, well, I haven't read that op-ed yet. I, you know, I... Is the kind of argument that one doesn't, the one typically hears, you know, from the Chamber of Commerce or, or something like that, rather than the, uh, rather than somebody like Farid. I, I, there's probably, I mean, there obviously there, we certainly something like environmental impact statements slow that you know that that is part of the story of why shovel ready isn't really shovel ready, right? So there's no there's there's a kind of built-in delaying factor, and some of that is actually, some of that is explicit. Some of you know. Uh, there's a lot of arguments about development, and you put some you put some uh, sand in the gears that actually slow some things down. And people often use it for things other than strict environmental impact in order to uh, in order to you know uh, slow down development. Uh, so that's probably you know if you're willing to accept certain environmental consequences, that's probably that's probably fair enough. I'm not sure about the you know I. I I remember looking at this a number of years ago, and that the actual cost impact of, you know, the the way you know, in construction to the Davis Bacon law that it's it's not that great, but it is a very you know construction is a very closed circle. It's not in 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 most states, and it's not something that you can suddenly uh, because it's so tightly controlled by the building trades uh, unions as well as employers that it's not. Um, it, it, it's it's not this it's not the same as the WPA where you can just suddenly you know throw in uh, thousands hundreds of thousands of, of, of new workers into construction projects because you do have to go through these uh, uh, through these structures uh, the price of destroying those structures permanently which are structures that actually you know make those jobs uh, humane and, 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 and adequately paid and safe um, that's a high price to pay if, if you destroy those permanently yeah, I think, and he might he might actually say something like a, a waiver or something like that. I mean, as opposed to a permanent yeah. a permanent change. Yeah. But uh, yeah. anyway, I, mean, you know, I, I must say, you know, I, I mean, and and the further argument you could make, I mean, again, the, 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 to me, you know, when you read stories about you know there's a highway and they want to build a you know a, a, a train track in between the median strip of the highway and they need an environmental impact statement for that. I mean, that just that to me that just falls in the right. category of pure harassment. I mean, that's not there's no fish or bird. This could be more affected by more construction inside the median of a highway uh, right, right. than before, and that's that's just that's again that's just as you said, sand in the sand in the gears, right. you know, on purpose. Right. And, but and, there's and, always and, some there's always some ridiculous example that counters some actually serious example, so you don't want to. 
Right. right. And, 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 well, and the fact that, you know, to dredge Los Angeles Harbor, they've been trying to do that for 10 years and they can't do it because, you know, they're getting sued all the time. And again, I mean, the chances right. of, you know, any fish that lives in L.A. Harbor um, is hardy enough to, you know, now is hardy enough to take whatever they do next uh, <laughs> right. on this. And I, and I don't mean to pick on those examples except that, um, you know, we do seem to be sort of, you know, to, to borrow a phrase from a different era and a different president, sort of a pitiful, helpless giant when it comes to actually doing these things, you know. And, right. and you, you, you made raise a point, which should get sort of noted, and that is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce does support these kind of things. Right. You know, I mean, the, the, the Cato Institute well, does. Well, they, 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 the they also support suspending, they also support suspending environmental impact statements and things like that, so. But, but they, and, they, and they, they do support, but, that's what they, but, they, but they fall in between because they're not saying the private sector has to do it. Right, right. They, they, ha they do have a kind of right Keynesianism, right public works, you know, as in right ideologically uh, approach, which doesn't quite fit with uh, much of the intelligentsia of the conservative, of the libertarian right. and conservative movement these days, right. which is against everything, just on, on, right. on, 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 on principle. And right. uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a, uh, there's a, there's sort of a conservative Hamiltonian, sort of a liberal ha Hamiltonianism uh, tradition, and the Chamber of Commerce is on the right end of that, and, you know, uh, Maybe Fried Zakaria or Roosevelt himself is sort of on the left end of that, but it, it, in both cases, it seems to be sort of neglected or shun, shunned by, on the one hand, the libertarians, and on the other hand, the Greens. Right, right. I think that's right. I think that's right. But, but, I, 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 but there's but, another but, dimension here too, which is that you know this goes back to you know talking about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and things like that. Everything we do now is kind of is neither straightforward public, like, you know, we're going to have the WPA people are going to work for the government and they're going to build these things, or they're going to work for local government and, you know, repairing schools or whatever, uh, or straight up private. Everything is, is in this public-private corner, and in that pub, in that margin between public, between the sort of half public, half private, you know, there's a lot of potential for corruption, there's a lot of potential for slowing things down, and there's a lot of screwy incentives that, that, uh, that adds aid efficiency and also give people much less of a sense that the government is, is, is actually doing something here. Um, you know, that, that, that's, there's a, a very important new book called The Submerged State by the political scientist Suzanne Mettler, which talks about all the ways in which uh, we, we've kind of lost our faith in government because we don't see most of the things that government does for us, especially when they're delivered in the form of tax credits or, you know, people don't know that they're that their the student loan they were getting from a bank was actually is actually a government program and, and and things like that and I think I think part of part of jumping in and, and actually getting big public works done is is actually being able to embrace that be, to, to, to state something as a fully public purpose and and, and just do it rather than kind of cut deals to do now that, who's, who's this, so that's an interesting I had not heard of that book submerged state it, by who's it's the called author? the submerged state and the author is Suzanne Mettler M E T T L E R a review of it coming out. It might be out today, so maybe. We'll oh wow! Well, okay, all right. We'll definitely link on that. Yeah. Um, who built Hoover Dam? Uh, yeah. Did, and they, are, are the Golden Gate Bridge? I don't mean to pick on one example. I mean, I mean it seems to me they're always though. I mean, yeah. I mean, they might have. They might. I mean, people might have been more aware in nineteen early thirties when the Golden Gate Bridge was finished, or mid thirties when the Golden Gate Bridge was finished, or Hoover Dam, or which was then called Boulder Dam for a while. Uh, um, it seems to me those were always contractors, though, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, I think the big work was done by contractors. A lot of the a lot of the parks work was 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 public employees. Okay, I mean, who built? The, I mean, but I, I, th I mean, I, I mean, I, again, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not necessarily just, arguing for wiping contractors out of the deal entirely, but I mean, we've, we're creating awfully complex structures now um, that have you know some private investment, some public investment. They're, they, they're a lot messier than what we were doing in the, in the 30s, and maybe that's just the nature of life. You know, I don't know that. that I mean, I mean, I, it seems, it's, I mean, actually, it seems to me just to be difficult here that a lot. It's an intriguing title, and I can certainly see the argument she's making on student loans or the home mortgage, or you know, and Fannie Mae and Freddie and stuff. But it seems to me sort of that the sort of the American way is to sort of mix up the public and the private. So how the railroads got built, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean how the, I mean, you know, canals. I mean, well, I mean, the, the railroads got built by private. And so well, but, but the public, the public gave the public gave the land gave and the eminent right. domain, and was typically helping on support the farms. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, and I'm, and I'm overstating her book because she doesn't go into infrastructure uh, issues as, uh, in any t to any great degree. Um, 
but I do think we're sort of what we're doing what we're doing right now, which is we're kind of holding out some incentives and hoping that the private sector generally moves in a certain direction. You know, isn't going to be it, it isn't going to be a fast turnaround. The way uh, it, it, I mean, not that not that the New Deal was a fast turnaround either, but but it doesn't provide that big uh, you know that that any kind of quick boost in in demand. Uh, or, or, or in the level of employment. And yeah, I, I'm actually sort of, a, in some cases, I'm sort of a fan of the visible hand, you know, as opposed to the invisible hand. Just yeah, to, yeah. To, to, when things happen, you know, when, when there's a crisis, in, in, you know, you, you, you have to win your war or something. You yeah. know, but I, I'm, I must say in that, in that vein, uh, which I, and that's one thing I do admire about the, the New Deal was, look, we're going to physically transform our world. We're going to build right. dams, we're going to build highways, we're going to build roads, we're going to drop, we're going to build the A-bomb, we're going to, you know, we're right. going to, you know, we're, we're not going to fight World War II with infantry and going across no man's land and barbed wire and machine guns. We're going to, you know, use airplanes and drop bombs on people and stuff. I, I, to me, that makes sense. And right. across the street from me, literally here as I sit here in Arlington, Virginia, there is a huge construction site going on. Again, this, you know, this is the one place where still a real estate boom in the, in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and there, there's, this, uh, there's several city blocks of open pit, and they are building this, you know, uh, condos and apparently high rise and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I look out my window every day and see them doing it and so on. And I am struck by how sort of antique the process is. You know, they, they you know, they, 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 the entire, you know, sides of the pit are covered up with boards. You know, you know they, they, each board put in place. Uh, um, it is to me the most handcrafted. Uh, industry you can imagine the side of you know putting you know ships in bottles uh, right. uh, um, and I'm amazed that and again I know there's lots of reasons for this but there's a, 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 it would seem to me you could have a factory somewhere that would just parachute in or, or helicopter in the entire building uh, um, and instead or build it just bring it in floor by floor and or, instead or, or use one of those 3d printers to uh, produce yeah, or use a 3d exactly exactly so, yeah, giant 3d printers that would do this thing I'm, I'm just sort of astonished um, you know, again, I realize you could make the argument that there's more people working this way than that, but I, you know, well, yeah, I, sure. I'm not such a luddite that I don't think yeah. that we could, if we really were to embrace technology in a serious way, we could build this building in 20 minutes or you know two weeks, and then find something else for you know 500 people to do or whatever the, whatever the number is. I, I, I you know, uh, continue to be astonished that we are so low tech in our approach to these things and. Uh, well, it's probably you know, it's probably five hundred people now, and a comparable project forty years ago would have been fifteen hundred people or something like that. I mean, you know. I don't well, know. but I mean, when you, when you get to the point where there, where each little piece of rebar is is put in the cement by hand, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that it is more efficient, you know, just and, and, and so on. But it's still unbelievably, you know, low tech, and I, I just wonder whether or not it's sort of a failure of imagination. I mean, you know, I was just. Um, you know, you probably saw the news too about this this uh, alleged terrorist who wanted to fly little sort of half-sized model, model airplanes into the Pentagon and the White House. Mm-hmm. Did you hear about this guy? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, right. Uh, and and I, you know, that that I mean, what are they going to do now? Are they going to you know start having to you know has the Homeland Security Department going to start you know you know scrutinizing model airplane sales and stuff you know i mean you know it, it, these planes are big i had no idea you could you could buy a model airplane that was you know six feet long um but with nanotechnology and nano destruction and so on i mean eventually you, know, you can imagine a, a, a airplane a lot smaller than that that you really could get it you know a, a five and dime uh, um you know carrying a pretty lethal package or something into the white house or the pentagon right. or the capitol okay, this is this is the the change of topics of all time i'm not sure that, i'm not well, sure it, the it, connection it, 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 I, I guess my point is is that if if people had thought about well, why why you know why don't we have you know force fields around buildings and stuff it, they're important to us i mean why why are we you know again the the the, the handcraft approach to homeland security is we now have to scrutinize every outlet that could possibly sell a projectile uh, uh, that could go into a building. Right. And, and and then we have to have this elaborate chain of informants and so on, where we're you know, I mean, you know. The, 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 well, we all know that's. Just, I mean, you know, that's just the, the like you know, there was some, supposedly somebody was doing something with liquid explosive, and now we now we check all liquids. Well, it wasn't like liquid explosive was more likely after than before. It was equally likely. But be, you know somebody stirred something up, so now we're gonna so now we're gonna call it liquid explosive. I mean the thing that the thing that you focus on is is, is never the thing that's 
actually going to happen is the thing that was right, right. That, that happened to be in the news. But to go back to the to the construction example, I mean, it makes a. I mean, we if what we're doing, we're we're trying to do two things. We're trying to do infrastructure in a way that also increases employment and aggregate demand, and. Construction is, is still one of the few things that actually creates a reasonable number of jobs for moderately skilled people. There's not like a lot of other things necessarily uh, for somebody with that background to do. And, and it's a very cyclical business, so families that are dependent on that uh, generally have a very, you know, can have a very rough life and, and, and a lot of debts and so forth because, because of the cyclicalness of the of that of that kind of employment, so I mean, I, I, it wouldn't be better for the economy if we just you know flew in a fully made building from Dubai. Well, I, I, I think it probably in the long run it probably would. I mean, again, this is sort of the argument that Bastiat had about you know breaking glass. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. he, he made the point this you know the, the French economist of the first half of the nineteenth century. Maybe right. this is say this is say 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 s a y say uh, say 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 he said, "Look, you know, if you break, if you break, if you, here's here's a good economic plan for you. You, you. you you break a piece of glass, and then the glaciers have to make a new piece of glass, and then somebody has to install it, and so the economy is stimulated." And he said, "But the problem is, you still have one window. You haven't. You don't have two windows. You have you have your own window back again. And so, you can make an argument for, uh, uh, you know, make total make work, and and you know, uh, Keynes himself did, and yeah, plenty yeah. of people since have." Uh, but it seems to me that you should combine, you know, and this is a little bit of what the New Deal was 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 good at was look we're, if we if we build, you know, you know, this, you know this, all the dams in the Pacific Northwest, uh, uh, there, there might be you know we'll have electricity for the entire you know you know the state of Washington and Oregon, and that might be disempowering you know somebody who's out there chopping wood for a fireplace, but it will be good for the economy overall. So if if you simply are content to keep make work as it, and in an end in itself, you will have, you know, again, this sort of, to my mind, kind of ridiculous spectacle of people doing work that was not that not that different than 100 years ago. And you would think that if we really were serious about building buildings, we build them quickly. We build them better, frankly, because uh -huh. uh, they'd be more, uh, you know, up to fact, factory specifications. You could use six sigma to, to perfect them. And then in the same spirit, we should act absolutely positively. Uh, think of something else for those people to do. Look, you, you no longer needed to hammer a board into the side of a, the wall of a, of a, a hole in the ground, um, but we'll think of something else for you to do, which again right. is... is that, I think but what's, that, the, what's the process of will think of something else for you to do? I mean, in the, in, in the American economy, that consists of good luck, buddy. Maybe there's, some, maybe there's a, a good retraining program at your local community college, and maybe there isn't, and maybe you can be a home health aide. I mean, it's just not... I mean... All I'm saying in the long run, I mean, yes, I mean the efficiency isn't terrible, but but in the moment of deep recession and possibly double dip, dep uh, in the moment of, of 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 slow recovery and possibly double dip recession, making construction vastly more efficient at this moment would would be a terrible idea. Well, and, unless you could then use the money because you were now you've now created an export industry where we where the our three D building technology printer. Uh, can can do them for the Chinese or the Indians and so on. Uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm not for automating the country out of right. the job. I'm not. I am for automation and for then saying, look, okay, it, it, smart people uh, could say, look, we have an opportunity. I mean, my, my favorite issue is is, is healthcare. You know, I, I think healthcare you know, in terms of you know, I think we're going about healthcare com completely wrong. Uh, um, and it's it, it, it's the joke and kind of sort of I thought of it in different contexts before, but now it is sort of relevant to this issue of, of construction. You would, if you looked at our 2.6 trillion dollar healthcare system, all, you know, 2.6 trillion with a T, mm -hmm. uh, you would think that it's run for the benefit of nursing homes. Right. Now, nursing homes are a huge employer, uh, um, and a lot of people have jobs, and you know, that, that's a good thing. Um, but if the plan of the nursing home and the basic point of our healthcare system is that if you are so Personally wrecked by Alzheimer's or diabetes or, or you know, stroke or something, that you spend 20 years uh, in 24/7 care at a, at a you know at a convalescent center. Um, that is an economic model for hiring a lot of people, 
but it's allowed. I mean, it, but it's a lousy economic model in my mind, and or at least it could be much improved by putting more money into uh, medical research and, and medical cure, so that we, people don't have Alzheimer's, and so the people who are currently working in the nursing home. Uh, would have to find something else to do, but again, I, I think part of the strategy would be to say, of course, well, of course, we will find something else for you to do. But, it, but, but we're not sure what it is yet, but we'll figure out something. And it won't be humiliating. And it won't be, you know, just waiting in line for an unemployment check. We'll think of something. But the reality that we'd be so infinitely better off if, you know, people could work another five or ten years uh, uh, because they're, because they're mentally able to do so. Uh, the 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 money coming in. I mean, let's face it. I mean, there's a, think of it. How much how much human capital we're flushing away um, every year in terms of just all the education we've, and all the skills people have gained, and then they you know either get sick or die. Um, that's silly. And, and right, you know, right. again, when when Franklin Roosevelt said it's nuts to have twelve year olds uh, you know getting polio and ending up you know paralyzed and crippled in, in an iron lung for the rest of their lives. That's crazy. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of money on the polio vaccine, which, I, which came into place t 10 years after FDR's death, um, and we'll have a vastly better life, and uh, there'll be so much more money coming in, we'll figure out something. People will be better off, even if they're no longer uh, pushing, pushing around people in wheelchairs. Right. Well, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, argue the, about the enormous desirability of a cure for Alzheimer's or, or, or other approaches that... that uh, that help people lead longer, productive lives, absolutely, and happy lives, and and uh, and, and it's it, I, I would never be against that. I do think that w w we're never conscious enough that in in wringing some of the costs out of our healthcare system, which is going to happen in a lot of different ways, and and um, uh, you know some things actually some 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 medical advances actually increase costs and increase uh, waste and some will actually uh, certainly decrease it. We're not conscious enough that bringing costs out of the healthcare system is going to strip out one of the major sources of employment and, and career ladders for people with limited skills. And a lot of those, I mean, I remember when I, you know, when I was working for a senator from New Jersey, the, the sort of impoverished cities of New Jersey would, you know, people from the city, the mayor or whatever, would come in and say, well, you know, we, we, we are looking at our economic strengths and weaknesses and where's our, you know, they would always consult with like Michael Porter and people at our business school and look at their comparative advantage. And they'd all say, our comparative advantage is, we, is healthcare. We have to train people for healthcare jobs because we have this hospital here, we have two nursing homes. We have a lot of elderly people who need home health care, and that's a, those are jobs that our high school graduates can, can have. Well, those aren't comparative advantages. Those are just like oh, the only thing that a city like Camden or Trenton actually had going on. Um, those are the only jobs that are available. And, um, and we, will, we will reduce the, those jobs. I, I have no doubt that, that, that we will bring costs out of the health care system, and, and there will be fewer of those jobs. But the process of saying, we'll find something else for you to do, is a, that is a huge societal challenge. It's not some. It's not a. I think a laissez-faire. Um, I, I agree. It's, I agree. It's not laissez-faire. Uh, and look, I also think that you know, I mean, healthcare is one of those issues. And back to home health, you know, as you know, service employee union members and you know everybody else who works in the industry. Um, <clears throat> to me, healthcare is a, a good that people want to consume. It's in economic terms a superior good. That when your as your income rises, you want to consume more of it. And so, you know, one of one of my hobby horses is why it is that both parties are sitting around dreaming up ways to cut healthcare spending. I'm for spending more on healthcare. And so, and by the way, so are the American people by a pretty thumping margin, like four to one. Mm -hmm. uh, they all want more. Uh, uh, the challenge is to is to accommodate their desire to be healthy and to, and and you know frankly to hire people to help them. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I want more health. And, and, and then also I want more time health. Do I don't want more health care. I mean, I'd certainly, I'd certainly take your, you know, if my, if it's my destiny to, you know, uh, suffer from Alzheimer's in twenty years or something like that, I'd much rather have your cure happen than be taken care of for another twenty years. So, um, I, I'm happy to have that. I'm happy to have the more cost-effective solution, which also would be more health. Uh, Right, and, and there would still be plenty of people because health is so important. You know, like, you know even if we cured Alzheimer's, you're still going to, you know, break your hip or whatever. You know, I mean, and, and I'd be right. morbid about it, but you know, you're still going to need health care, um, and there's still plenty for people to do. Um, right. But if if people who were, you know, in prime earning years 
uh, at 65 could work to 75 and effectively. Uh, that's a lot more money for the, whatever they're doing, that's a lot more money for the economy and potentially a lot, a lot more people to hire. So again, the, the, chal the, the, the challenge is, uh, the, I think, to sum up the, both this construction point and uh, the healthcare point and the thing you asked about, which is my homeland security point about the force fields, if we had a force field around the White House, or 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 you know, or just somehow made cockpits invulnerable, or you know, take 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 another example. Uh, if Libya has, if twenty thousand surface-to-air missiles seem to, have, you know, been sprung loose from Libya, um, you know, and who knows if they all work, and who knows where they're going to go, and so on. But the, the the nightmare scenario of some somebody sitting at the Rome airport, you know, you know, half a mile away from the runway, firing off a rocket at a, at a passenger jet. Um, we better think hard. It's just extraordinary. It's extraordinary that that hasn't happened uh, yet. It's amazing, that, yeah. Because that was. They, a they tried. Well, there was one. There's one case in Kenya or someplace in like 1998. Right. right. Where they fired an Israeli an El Al plane and missed, you know, right. happily. Uh, right. uh, but you're right. It, it it is extraordinary, and, and maybe there's more measures, countermeasures, than, than we're aware of. Right. Uh, um, right. But still, it seems to me that this is, you know, I mean, again, uh, uh, you know, when you when you when you read that the NYPD has a helicopter that could conceivably go up in the air and shoot at an airplane airliner coming at the, you know, some some skyscraper in Manhattan, and the helicopter has a 50 caliber machine gun in it, you know, you know, uh, um, you know that that that's a remind. I mean, I'm, I, if if it were to come to that, I'm all I'm all for the NYPD having that capacity, although you know the potential for tragedy there, I guess, is also substantial. Um, there are a lot of ways to shoot down airplanes, and we better think harder about, if, if terrorism is going to continue, we better think harder about how to protect them. And again, I guess my, the point, that what the, the theme, at least in my mind, running through all these is, if we had a big and bold vision of transforming our environment to make it better for us and more habitable for us, uh, we'd be a lot better off for it, rather than Trying to sort of deal with you know the sort of low tech solutions where they're sort of ha hampered by you know environmental impact statements, Davis Bacon, and our own lack of imagination. I mean, there is we are it is it, the, the the U.S. Capitol would be safer with a force field around it than by every homeland security gumshoe uh, trying to chase down somebody with a, a suspicious name who just bought a model rocket or a model airplane. Would you be able to go in and out of the Capitol as a? I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, maybe just be a shield like above, you know, above, you know, above ten feet or something. I mean, who knows what it would be uh -huh. exactly? Uh -huh. But the thing is, it, it's, it's, it, you know, it, it, I mean, take, take, take Israel. I mean, it, you know, it, Israel, it, it, the Hezbollah had, had, you know, in two thousand six had thirty thousand rockets or whatever they were, uh, and they fired a good chunk of them at Israel. I think they killed like a hundred Israelis. Uh, in 2006, and you know, and, and then uh, you know, and obviously, you know, lots of people killed in the military side as well. But I think it was, I think it was something like 100 civilians, mm -hmm. and you know, and the Israelis bombed the crap out of northern Lebanon, which in this case I, I don't dispute as a justified measure. But now, five years later, according to the same reports, Hezbollah has 40,000 rockets. Mm -hmm. There is the, the the military strategy of bombing people a, as they are firing rockets at you. Seems to be completely, you know, I don't say completely, but substantially bankrupt. Yeah, of course, absolutely, well, absolutely. Okay, well, all right. So, so. But that's not just that's not the solution to that. Isn't build a force field around Israel? The solution to that is, you know, work out the damn Middle East. Well, that, okay. Now that's the dispute. I knew we. I knew you know we, we got to wrap up here. We. I knew we. I. I, mean, I, I was in the spirit of blogging heads doesn't thrive on confrontation the way, say, cable news does, but nonetheless, that's my point. I guess I, I would say the chances of the Israelis, the, the most peacenicky leader of Israel imaginable, uh, you know, whoever that would be. I, 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 it's not a moment where I can be optimistic about, about right. Middle East peace. I'm just saying, the, 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 only, the, the alternative, I mean, I agree with you, obviously, that, you know, bombing Lebanon it isn't a long-term solution to anybody's problems, but I disagree that the only alternative is build a force field. And I, I can even see, I can even see the force field around the capital more than I can. I mean, right. and it's also, you know, I mean, any meaningful, you know, there's no magic solution that allows you to continue to have, you know, the proverbial open society and also have that level of security. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's fair, fair enough. I, again, I, I would say, you know, if the lion and the lamb, 
without, without a lot of negotiation. <laughs> the lion and the lamb should never lie down together unless the lamb has a force field. Uh, All right, uh, that sounds good. <laughs> and I don't mind, you know, listen, I, I, your, your futurism has come true more often as far as I'm, the time I've known you than, uh, than not. So I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to laugh at anything, but, uh, but I don't think it makes all the, all the challenges necessarily go away. No, it doesn't. But my, my, my future is, is, is more the failure of the presentism. I'm not, I'm not sure the future has done very well at all, but the present has failed pretty badly. And so uh, right. the future, future looks better by comparison. Anyway, anyway, we're, okay. uh, um, Mark? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Okay, and thank you all. We'll, we'll see you again next time. Okay, bye-bye.